say, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to teach a little bit from God's word, uh, maybe over the next couple of uh, times that I'm preaching in the Sunday evening service, on how to pray for the lost. And uh, tonight I want to talk about the reason why it's important for us to pray for the lost. And maybe you know of someone that is unsaved, and uh, you've got friends or family members. I know uh, I had written down a couple of names of folks that uh, we've been praying for uh, that are unsaved. And it's important that we pray for unsaved people. And depending on where you are theologically, uh, you might have different perspectives on this. Um, I, there are some extremes, I suppose. Some might say, well, there's no sense in praying for somebody to get saved because God would never uh, violate someone's free will and never uh, force anybody to get saved. And so it's, uh, it's not up to him. It's up to them. They've got to make that decision. Uh, there's a, a, another extreme position, I think, that some might take that would say, well, there's no sense in praying for somebody to, be get, to get saved because God knows who's going to get saved and he's going uh, to bring them to himself whether you pray for him or not. He's going to do it and it's all up to him. It has nothing to do with us. <laughs> and so there are those two perspectives I think are both extreme and I think are both not biblical. And, uh, and I think we can find in God's word... Um, some instructions on how and why we ought to pray for unsaved people to be saved. So we want to look at some doctrine about that and, uh, and see why it's important for us to pray and exactly how to do it. So it'll be several weeks that we'll be uh, looking at this topic and hopefully uh, we'll be more and more encouraged uh, to pray specifically for individuals to be saved. Why should we pray for the lost to be saved because it is a spiritual battle it is a spiritual battle anytime somebody gets saved is a it is a work of the holy spirit and so we ask god to send his holy spirit to do a work in someone's heart and in their life but even more than that there's a reason that we ought to pray for the lost because they are they are bound by the devil. I want to look at just a few things from Scripture that help us help give us some insight uh, into this idea that the lost are held captive by the devil himself, and uh, and you and I, in all of our strength and ability, are not uh, able to free them. We can't do that. Only God can do that, and even they themselves are powerless to free themselves of the bind that the devil has on them. I want, to, I want you to notice a couple of things. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, uh, we see Jesus in this interesting uh, discussion uh, with the scribes and Pharisees, and, uh, and he says something very interesting here. Uh, in fact, let me go back to, um, let's see, uh, verse 42, verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded, proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So the scribes and Pharisees hated Jesus, and they were claiming to be children of God. And Jesus was uh, saying, wait a minute, if you really were children of God, then you would accept me, because Jesus is God's son, Jesus is God in the flesh. Verse 43, why, why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Wow, that's interesting. And why could they not hear his word? Verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. 
Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. There's a, a common saying today, folks like to say, that, oh, we're all God's children. We're all God's children. That's not what Jesus said. If we were all God's children in that sense, in the sense that Jesus says here, then we would all be listening to Jesus. And everyone would be listening to Jesus, but some people don't listen to him. And in fact, you didn't listen to him before you were saved. <laughs> and so this is an act of God. Those that are unsaved are in the category, the, the family, so to speak, of the devil. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that we're not created by God. I'm not saying that, uh, that in that sense we don't come from him. He gives us the ability to think and he gives us uh, the, a, a will to choose. He gives us the, the abilities to, uh, to have that relationship with him. However, before God's Holy Spirit opens our heart, before we accept the truth of the word of God and believe it in faith, before that happens, we, are, we belong to the devil. We are children of the devil. And that's what Jesus was saying of these uh, these ones here. Now, specifically, even for the scribes and Pharisees, even more so because they were opposing directly Jesus Christ. They were opposing him. And there are people, the world is full of people opposing Jesus Christ. And before a person accepts him, they're opposing him. They belong to the devil. And so because the devil holds them, there needs to be a supernatural spiritual act in order for them to be free from that bondage. Let's look at another, uh, another passage here. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Why is it important for us to pray? Because this is, this is a spiritual battle that is taking place. When a person is saved... It's a miracle. It's an act of God. Acts chapter 26 and verse number 14. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul. He's sharing his testimony yet again. And he says in verse 14, When we were all fallen to the earth, he's recounting that time when he, he got saved on the road to Damascus. He saw the bright light and they all fell down off their horses onto the ground. He says, When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And, uh, and that, that's a, a terminology, kicking against the pricks or the, the goads. Uh, if you were driving a, uh, um, a chariot or driving oxen uh, to, to, uh, to pull a wagon or something, uh, to prod them on, they would have some kind of a sharp, pointy rod, and they'd just kind of poke them, <laughs> you know, get moving, poke, 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 and that would get the, the team moving ahead. And so Jesus says, you're kicking against the pricks here. It doesn't do any good for the, the horses or the oxen to kick that pointy stick. <laughs> that's not going to feel very good, so you don't do that. And that's kind of the picture here. God says, you're, you're kicking against the pricks. You're kicking against these goads here. Verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I appear, in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Now look at this verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. 
Wow, what a statement here. God tells Paul, uh, I, am, I am going to use you. I am I'm going to make you a minister. You are going to go not only uh, to, to preach to the Jews, but more specifically to the Gentiles. In fact, he would become the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he would, he would go to the Gentiles for this purpose. When he sent him to the Gentiles, he would go to open their eyes. Well, why would their eyes need to be opened? Because they're blind. They're blind. They're blind to spiritual things. They're blind to the truth. So to open their eyes, and he, and he goes on, to turn them from darkness to light. They're blind, wandering around the darkness. They need to be turned to the light. And then he continues with this uh, explanation. And from the power of Satan unto God. What does that mean? A person that is unsaved is blind they are in darkness, and they are under the power of Satan. That's why we need to pray for them. They're under the power of Satan. They need to be freed. They need deliverance. And so we need to pray for them. Uh, we need to plead with God. Uh, and, and so here we see Paul describing that, or, or at least uh, the Lord describing it to Paul. Uh, his job to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. Let's look at another one in uh, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, Jesus now speaking again, and uh, he teaches here on, on this unpardonable sin. I think there's something important for us to uh, glean from this passage uh, when it comes to why we ought to pray for people to be saved. Mark chapter 3 and verse 22. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Jesus had just cast out some demons, and so the scribes and Pharisees are upset with him, uh, and so they, they attribute the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to the devil. And, and rather than recognizing this is the work of God's Holy Spirit, they say, no, it can't be that. We know it's not human. We deny that it is God. By process of el elimination, they claim that it must be Satan. Wow, that's a dangerous place to be. Uh, when you attribute to Satan the work of God, and that's what they were doing. Now, verse 23 and he called unto them, uh, and I'm sorry, and he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? It doesn't even make sense. Why am I using the power of the devil to cast out demons? That doesn't make sense at all. How can Satan cast out uh, Satan? Verse 24 And if the kingdom, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. It's ridiculous to think that the devil would be instrumental in casting out demons because they're on the same team. Verse 27, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. How does a demon get cast out? Well, it's, it's cast out because someone stronger than the devil, stronger than the strong man, comes and delivers that soul from the devil. That's how it happens. Somebody stronger has to be there. Somebody has to bind the strong man of the house. The house there being the, the individual, the person. Somebody has to bind that strong man and then uh, spoil his goods. Then uh, he will overcome there. And so first he binds a strong man and then he will spoil his house. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But 
He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Why is it that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost or attributing the divine work of God to the devil, why is that such a serious offense? Because it is only the work of the Holy Spirit that can deliver any soul from the devil. And so if you deny the work of the Holy Spirit, there is no hope whatsoever of your ever being delivered. Because it's his work. He's the only one strong enough to do it. You are under the power of the devil. You are under the power of Satan. This is why in just a, a, a few weeks, we launch into our missions month and we talk about reaching souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ because souls all over the world are blinded to the truth of the gospel. They have no hope. They have no help unless God does a work in their life by his Holy Spirit and through his word by the power of his son. That's the only way that they can be saved. The only way. There is no hope apart from his work. And so <clears throat> why do we have to pray for unsaved people to get saved? <laughs> because... It's only God that can do it. And so we need to plead with him uh, to save their souls. We'll get into, in the next couple of weeks, some specifics on what to pray for exactly and how all this works together. But what I want you to see tonight is the importance of praying because this is a spiritual battle. One more passage, uh, maybe two. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> I think this is so crucial and this makes it so clear for us to understand the importance of praying for unsaved friends and family members. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 3. The Apostle Paul writing here and um, <clears throat> he is explaining his ministry. And this is what he says, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? Well, Jesus is God. But in this sense, the God of this world. Notice it's little g. The God of this world, the one who has been given some authority in this world, is the devil in this verse. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The devil has blinded the minds of those that are unsaved. Those that believe not. Anybody unsaved has spiritual blinders on. They are spiritually blind. And why? Because the devil's blinded them. And why does he blind them? The verse continues. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. What was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees? They would not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Their eyes were closed to it. They were blinded to it. They didn't want to accept Jesus as Messiah. They didn't want to believe that he truly was who he said he was. The devil's doing the same thing in hearts today. He is blinding people so that they do not believe the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So that they cannot have the, the light of the gospel shine on them. They have blinders on. It is the work of the devil. He has, he, as a strong man, he is binding them. He has blinded them. He is holding them. He has chained them. And he is powerful, but not more powerful than God. That's why we need to pray. Because they are in, in bondage. They are blinded. They need the light of the gospel of Christ to shine upon them. And that's why he says in verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. We're all about Jesus Christ because he's the only one that has the power to overcome the devil and his power in blinding lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ. One more verse, 1 Corinthians, or one more passage, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 2. We might think to ourselves, why don't, you know, why don't people just, why don't they just read the Bible and, and understand? And some of them do, and God's Holy Spirit opens their minds. But that's the point. God's Holy Spirit does a work when they read the Word. And if God's Holy Spirit doesn't do the work, then whatever they see and read and hear, it bounces right off. Have you ever, have you ever tried to witness to somebody and it just seems like you're, you're talking to the wall? Yeah. I mean, it's like you're pleading with them and you're reasoning with them and you're begging them and you're showing them. And I mean, you're doing everything you possibly can and it just seems like it's like, you know, hello, are you hearing me? Can you hear anything? And it's just not, there's nothing going on there. They just don't get it. Doesn't seem to make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now verse 14, but the natural man, this is an unsaved person in his natural state, a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are, what does it say? Spiritually discerned. What does that mean, spiritually discerned? Spiritually discerned doesn't mean uh, that it's some weird feeling. You know, we, we kind of, we've changed this word spiritual into some kind of emotional experience. It's not that. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. How are these things discernible? How do we understand these things? It happens in our spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. See, it is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. God's Holy Spirit illuminates the minds of those who are being saved so that they can accept by faith the gospel of Jesus Christ. These things are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, by God's Holy Spirit, we open up this book, and we read it, and it comes alive to us, and we understand it, and it makes sense to us. But somebody who's unsaved, somebody who's who the Holy Spirit has not freed from the blinders of the devil, they will open up this book and they'll look at it and they'll think, yeah, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. It must be the work of God in a heart. It must be. Now our responsibility is to take this word. Our responsibility is to give this word. God will be faithful he will be faithful and accompany his word with the Holy Spirit and power. But we must pray. We must pray that that will happen and ask God that that will happen. Next time, we'll look at some reasons, some more reasons why, and some specifics as to why we should pray for unsaved people. Maybe somebody would say, well, I don't, I don't see in, in the Bible where it says we're supposed to pray for unsaved people. Well, we'll find it, and you'll see it as we study it more later on. But tonight, just to see this fact, why do we pray for unsaved people? Because it must be a work of God when they're saved. And so we pray to the God who can do the work so that they will be saved. And so let's, let's be faithful, praying for the unsaved. Let's make a list. Let's call out their name before God. Let's plead with his Holy Spirit to open their hearts and tear the blinders off. Let's pray that God will bind the strong man 
so that those lost souls can be saved. Let's pray for that and watch and see what God does because it's only his work. It's only his work. Our Father, we thank you for the truth in Scripture. I pray that you'd help us to believe it, help us to understand it more. And Lord, there are many things that we may not understand. There are many things that uh, may be confusing to us perhaps, but Lord, there are some things that are clear. And as your Holy Spirit opens our minds to these truths, I pray that we would believe them by faith. And Lord, I pray that in just a few moments, as we have our prayer time, that we would in fact pray for lost souls to be saved. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.